Uh, thank you all for uh, taking a little time here. I really appreciate being back at the conference after five years. So um, uh, last time, if you, any of you were here five years ago, I had lots more hair. I was much better looking. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, I, I, do, I was asked to take a little step back and uh, look at kind of the past 10 years, uh, what, you know, where we've kind of come, take a little snapshot of today, and then try to look a little bit out. And Peter did actually a nice job of part of that, so I'll, uh, I'll steal from, uh, from him in, uh, in that. But uh, I realized a couple things as I did that. One is I realized 10 years ago, uh, wasn't that long ago. Uh, I, I feel like I'm really, really getting old now because my children 10 years ago was a, an eternity. Uh, for me, as I was starting to think about where we were 10 years ago, uh, I, I started to think back where we were 20 years ago and then realized, no, you know, it's, it's been this time. So uh, it, it became a little bit more manageable from that perspective. And, uh, and the way that we see computing evolve in that time frame uh, has actually been pretty interesting uh, within both uh, the industry, and I'll try to give a, a view, a snapshot of this from how we see it from an industry perspective, and then how we just see it from a supercomputing perspective uh, overall, and attack that uh, from that perspective. And, and the one thing that I would say uh, is I think a lot of things that have evolved to where we are today have been relatively evolutionary things. And, uh, and we've gotten a, a huge way with relatively evolutionary thinking. And I think as we start to think about things going forward, a, a lot of new possibilities open up to us, uh, which weren't really available before, and it's gonna require us to think a little differently. And, and this isn't just uh, over the next 10 years, but I think even just over the next few years, as some of the changes come down the pipe that Peter talked a little bit about, and you can start to think about a new way to manage your data and manage your computing environments in a very high performance computing way. So I, I like this kind of view of what got us here today uh, maybe isn't quite what we need to get us to where we need to go tomorrow, and, and a new way of thinking about it is required. Uh, when we think about it from an industry perspective and we look at um, over the last 10 years and try to put ourselves back and, and think about the progress that we've made over the last 10 years, you know, one of the big things is these new survey techniques that are really starting to drive model size and complexity. The, the PGS Triton survey, uh, which was a few years ago, uh, is a huge example of just a, a whole nother level in capability uh, that's really starting for us to really make us rethink about how to do modeling and simulation uh, in this way. Uh, you know, a, an adoption of approaches, you know, RTM has been here for a very, very long time. FWI is now getting pretty uh, leveraged quite broadly now and has, still has a long way to go uh, as that evolves uh, over time. But starting to use these techniques now is starting to drive a new need in the computing system, more from a capability standpoint than just a throughput or capacity standpoint overall in computing. You know, over the last 10 years, we pretty much have stayed mostly in this one shot per node computing model uh, within the industry, and that's driven a lot of our thinking, uh, and we're gonna come back to that point here uh, in a little bit because I think that that's one thing that is definitely uh, going to change over time with the way that computing systems are going to align over the next few years. And obviously our systems have gotten bigger and, uh, and as we move forward uh, that's going to continue, we believe. Uh, from a supercomputing perspective, you know we pretty much lived off the clock rates growing and living off that has been a huge part of what we've been able to do with computing, and we haven't had to focus as much on making the entire system scalable uh, and all components because we've been able to get a lot of our performance gains just from that individual core getting a lot faster over time. But what we have done, I think, as an industry very successfully is really driven the cost of computing down uh, very substantially. And I think that that's a huge success story overall uh, within the industry over the last 10 years to really focus on getting that cost of computing down 
quite a bit by leveraging a lot of commodity technologies uh, and new computing technologies at the same time. As we take a snapshot today about where we are, uh, I would say that these new survey techniques are still driving a lot from the industry standpoint. Um, you know, really starting to challenge to get new science out of the machines, much, much more clarity in our models and much, much finer grain resolutions in that. And workflows becoming so much more important than just the individual simulations or models that we're doing. Uh, it's all becoming much more about the workflow and putting a lot more pressure on how we manage the data through that workflow, something that Peter talked uh, a little bit about here. I think another thing that we're starting to see from a number of industry leaders is starting to think about transitioning from just pure driving the cost out of computing to is there a way to use com computing to get a competitive edge in the industry. Uh, still focused on return on investment, so not giving up that side of things, but is there a new way of thinking about this? Can I take advantage of with this huge growth of data, can I take advantage of this in a unique way now and start to think about my computing environment differently, still being able though to justify how I'm doing that from an ROI perspective within the industry, which is a good balance point, I think, overall. Uh, we're starting to see data sets uh, grow tremendously, uh, even just over the last couple years starting to get very, very big data sets overall. Uh, and we're starting to, as we talk with customers uh, around the industry, people are starting to plan for some pretty large systems uh, over time and starting to think about how do we manage, how do we use that effectively within our environment. And that's kind of a snapshot of where we are today from the industry. And then when I look at it just from a supercomputing perspective, um, single cores are getting slower. They haven't stopped, they've actually gotten slower. And so now how do we start dealing with this and starting to think about a socket and a computing, where's my computing environment overall? This really has changed things overall. And one of the big things from a system standpoint today um, is that it's really about throughput of that machine. We used to be very, very focused on individual feeds and speeds. We used to talk about our line speeds a lot and what are our CERTES rates uh, and, and what type of lithography are we on and all of those kinds of things. What we're finding is those things are getting really less and less important uh, overall and it's really about congestion in the system and how do we manage this congestion overall within the machine. And this has become a really, really huge change for us uh, over time. We found, for instance, a, uh, a commodity system at Cray. We sell both, of course, commodity systems as well as very tightly integrated high-end supercomputers. Uh, so we get to do a lot of looking at these two environments and comparing them head to head uh, and understanding kind of the pros and cons of these different environments, which is really, really important from an operational perspective. Uh, but what we found is if you look at commodity systems uh, and you just run a single benchmark on the machine, an otherwise idle machine, especially if it's a little toy benchmark, uh, overall you get very different results than when you start loading this machine uh, with lots and lots of different applications and you start to get a lot of uh, uh, cross uh, cross talk on the interconnect and things like that. These are where things start to matter. For instance, just an optimized MPI library, and when I say optimized, I'll say the standard is uh, an MPITCH library, what you would get from an Intel package would be kind of the, the normal standard that everybody gets to use. Optimized libraries, we're seeing 30 and 40% differences on a loaded system. Uh, interconnects from a standard you know, InfiniBand network or something like that, uh, you, you can get 50% better performance and capabilities. Line speeds and such, uh, you know, bandwidth and latency numbers look relatively similar, uh, but it's all becoming about how do we control congestion on the machine? How do we do retries? How does job placement uh, affect performance and capability of the system? And all of these kinds of things that are really, really starting to matter much, much more from a uh, supercomputing perspective. And then, of course, parallelism being really the way that we're going to 
broadly get to here. And so a lot more work around tools to understand our applications and understand the hotspots and how to parallelize them. Um, libraries to more efficiently lay out the machine and take advantage of it. It's really becoming about how much efficiency can we get out of each of those individual processors. Uh, there's a great uh, discussion uh, in the industry and the interconnect side about uh, should you do uh, offloading of the processing of the, uh, of the uh, network uh, onto the network or should you process it on the node. Uh, I'll tell you that th that's not a very important discussion quite honestly because we don't use all of the capability of a node anymore. Uh, there's a lot of free cycles uh, on that node that we can take advantage of. What's more importantly is how we're managing uh, all of this from an overall computing environment. And so that's kind of a snapshot of where we are today uh, and over the last 10 years. So we've come quite a distance, I think, over that time. Now, the harder thing, of course, is to start to look out in time. And what do we think that things are going to do uh, over the next few years? And one thing that we're hearing a lot from many of you uh, is that you're believing that just over the next few years, the processing capabilities are going to go up about an order of magnitude, and over a 10-year period, a couple orders of magnitude from where we are today, which is starting to be uh, really, really challenging. And there's a lot of crossovers between a lot of other industries that are traditionally using some of the largest supercomputers and what we've used within the oil and gas field, which are very large themselves. Um, ResSim becoming bigger and bigger uh, and more important, really not being relegated to a very small part of our computational mission, but potentially can start to do really, really interesting things uh, on the ResSim side, not just the seismic side of the house. And that's very, I think, very exciting for us overall. We've had some recent uh, examples I'll talk about in a second uh, of some really amazing ResSim results uh, overall. And we're starting to see from uh, all of you a discussion around how do we take advantage of what's going on in this big data analytics world, what's going on in deep learning and artificial intelligence, and, and is there a way to kind of more optimize the workflows and the quality of results that we're getting by bringing these technologies together overall? Uh, over time. You know, as I, uh, whoops, huh. how about that? I never use a mouse, uh, so <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh. Uh, the, uh, I've seen one of these before. My kid's a gamer, so I know it, uh, it's, it's a much nicer mouse than this one, though, so we'll have, but uh, when we look at kind of what's going on in the industry over the next 10 years, uh, I've mentioned parallelism. I'm just going to say it's parallelism everywhere, through all layers of the system, whether that be uh, threads becoming much more important than cores or nodes uh, as we start to think about these systems overall and start to be how do we manage these potentially millions of threads uh, that we have on these systems that are all going uh, in parallel. Application architectures are really starting to change as systems become wider and wider, not getting individually faster as we talked about, just getting a lot big, kind of like me, getting uh, wider uh, as, uh, as we go out uh, in time overall. Uh, I mentioned about the interconnects as we start to think about managing congestion and throughput uh, on these networks is becoming more and more challenging. How do we start to deal with things uh, like we, in order to be cost effective of these resources, we have to keep them very highly utilized. Um, much, much more highly utilized than typically is done in commercial IT, for instance, uh, where maybe you know, people are happy if they can get to 30 or 40 percent utilization on their machines. Uh, we're in the 90 plus percent utilization of machines, and that's causing uh, you know, more and more congestion. And as the nodes, as we'll talk about, get higher and higher performance. It puts much more pressure on the interconnect and the network within the system than we have had in the past. And so we have to start thinking about those things as a much, much more important thing because the, the bandwidth ratios of the machines are not what we typically have seen over the past few years. They're getting really different. 
And even though we're not moving like from uh, the good old days of CREA vector technology to MPPs or clusters, we're not seeing that kind of a shift overall. Architecturally, it's causing almost the same amount of change within the machines uh, as we go forward in time. Peter talked a lot about the memory and storage hierarchy, and I'm gonna come back to that a little bit more too, but I would say that the biggest change that we're seeing in the systems is the memory and storage hierarchy. That is where a lot of the magic's gonna be, uh, is how do we take advantage of this really deepening hierarchy uh, of, uh, of both memory and storage, and I thought Peter did a really great job at talking a little bit about this. Um, processor choice is gonna start to grow again. <laughs> um, so we, uh, as we look around the industry at the systems that we have out in, in most of the major uh, oil companies and, and processing companies, uh, it's mostly Xeon or GPUs. That's what we pretty much see today. We will continue to see those, but we'll start to see these many core processors, uh, Xeon Phi, uh, We'll see more options, you know, with AMD and ARM and other processors like that starting to come in. FPGAs playing an interesting role as they get more integrated on the silicon with the processors uh, technologies. So we're starting to see a lot more um, options there. And we think that over time, systems will become more and more heterogeneous because these different processing technologies all have different pros and cons and, and, and not all fit every job. But what we really want to do is start to manage all of the data of the machine as tightly as we can. So instead of having separate machines to do all of these things, we believe that we're going to converge all of that into one central system to manage so we don't have to move data because it gets very expensive to start to move it from a very high performance network on one machine off to a lower performance network and back onto another high performance network on another machine. And so we'll see some convergence uh, there overall. And while I was only asked to look out the next 10 years, which I think CMOS feels really good to me over the next 10 years, as we start to think about beyond 10 years, we're gonna have to start to think a lot more about, as we already are today, what's next? And that's a really tricky question uh, overall, I think, uh, as we go forward in the industry. So I think that this next round, exascale systems, this like next thousand that we're gonna get over the next few years, is gonna be the last thousand X of processing that we're gonna get in CMOS. And uh, if you wanna go further to Yada scale uh, or Yada flops, I don't think that that's probably gonna be CMOS technology that's gonna get us out in that time frame uh, as we go forward. But I do wanna talk just a little bit and I'll, I'll, I'll try to uh, talk a little bit from where Peter just took you a little bit ago and, and look at it from a whole system perspective. When we see that these are systems in the next few years, by the way, this is not looking out 10 years yet. This is a much, this is less than a handful of years uh, that we'll start seeing 10 plus teraflops on a single node with very, very wide vectors or GPU style computing on that node. And so we need to think about how we're gonna organize our applications to take advantage of those much wider vectors uh, that we're gonna have uh, overall on a node. So a node is gonna become very, very high performance. Again, shifting completely the balance of the system out to these nodes. We're already seeing some, um, some vendors starting to think about architectures where a node is even heavier than this. So where you could have uh, another order of magnitude or two out in each individual node, which I think is not very balanced when we think about a, a big scaling system, but for smaller scale jobs, I think that those are kind of interesting to have big fat, fat nodes out there if you can run your whole job in a node. Once you have to start to scale nodes, you need to think about overall system balance. It's kind of like GPU computing today. 
Um, if you can keep your model in a single node, you can put four or eight GPUs on a node, and that kind of makes a lot of sense. If your model has to scale beyond that, you don't want that much GPU computing out on the node. You want to more balance it with your interconnect bandwidth, because now you're worried not about the bandwidth between all the GPUs uh, on a node, you're worried about the bandwidth between all the GPUs on the system. And so you need to change that ratio. And so we're seeing more of a one to one or one to two ratio for jobs that are scaling beyond a node. And we have to start thinking about this in, in the same way as we go forward. Uh, I completely agree with Peter on the on package memory, the high bandwidth memory. That is going to be critical overall. Uh, but it is also going to probably cause one of the biggest changes in this industry which means the amount of memory that you have in that high bandwidth package per how much flops you have in that node is a ratio that is way different than we have today. And so this kind of one shot per node model will be highly, highly inefficient in these systems over time. And that is a huge change overall, I think, about how we have to think about computing going forward, because you're not going to want to leave that high bandwidth memory if you, if you don't have to. Because the next level, as Peter talked about, as you get out to like non-volatile memory, 3D crosspoint, or things like this, they start to not feel like memory. Even though you can, you can access it like memory, it starts to feel so far away that it starts to look more like local disk uh, on your machine that you can read and write to just like memory. Um, and flash starts to become the next storage. So the kind of the tiers of the storage hierarchy all start to move up and really, really deepen. Overall, disk starts to look like archive or campaign storage, as Peter talked uh, a little bit about and how we manage that. So this is a really, really big shift overall in this kind of memory and storage hierarchy that's a big change overall. From a system perspective, we're going to get very, very high performance interconnects. They're going to be very fast and, and also thinking about huge systems with one or two or maybe three hops to get across the entire machine. So very, very low latency, very, very short hop networks uh, overall, but systems kind of on order of 100,000 nodes. Uh, you know, 10 to 100 million system threads on the nodes. And again, I think that when we think about the parallelism, the threads are what we should really think about. Uh, that's how we see some of the largest systems in the exascale era starting to play out. But those same system structures is what's going to be handled at even a single cabinet of a cluster today, because you'll have those same technologies that you can use in that environment. And so that's I think a huge change of how we're thinking about computing over the next few years that's going to cause us to rethink a lot of the modeling that we're doing today. And there's been some great work on that overall. The other thing from a Cray perspective is so for since our founding with Seymour, we've really only focused mostly on scientific and engineering models. That's really what we've done, is taken uh, a scientific and engineering model, let's call it a seismic model, put that on a supercomputer, and try to show the best, prettiest picture that we can of what the subsurface looks like. And more and more now, people are trying to say, can we integrate this with analytics? Can we start to integrate this with tools like Hadoop and Spark and different kind of analytics models? Can we start to do the same thing with deep learning and artificial intelligence models and start to bring these together? Because today, we think about these as completely different systems. We're going to do our deep learning over here on this machine, and then we're going to do our modeling on this machine. Um, but overall, what we really want is we want the outputs of these to, to affect the inputs of the other. And the, uh, and the outputs, it's almost like pre and post processing in a constant loop uh, as we think about the workflow. So more and more we're going to want these integrated again on the same system because we don't want to be able to have to move data off that machine going forward. And then of course we have this huge flux of data coming into the systems that we're going to have to deal with and build these models from. And some of that is streaming data uh, over time, not just 
uh, single data sets. And so what we've really been starting to think about is in this model, this converged model, how are we going to compute in this environment? How are we going to store and manage our data in this environment? And how are we going to do analytics in this environment together? So we can come up with a better answer and a better solution overall. There's some great early work uh, done in here. I'm going to uh, share some work uh, by PGS that's pretty amazing. They did this uh, really uh, impressive survey called Triton. Uh, and um, I know that you guys, most of you in the room, have heard about this story, uh, so I cannot do it justice. Uh, but, uh, but at a computing perspective, uh, really looking at a very, very large data set, um, ha over half a petabyte of data, uh, and, and doing that in memory across the machine on a globally addressable memory. So how do we lay this data out across an entire machine, not kind of the traditional, again, one shot per node model, uh, and use FWI as part of that. And uh, we've been uh, very excited to be able to work with them to do this kind of a model. And, and one of the first questions was, is with this size of data, is there a better way to compute this? Is there a different way to compute this than we have been doing on our commodity cluster technologies overall? And we worked together to figure out how to take advantage of some, some unique supercomputing technology in order to do the computing part in a different way. But what's even more exciting is some work that they did recently uh, with some uh, partners at Rice University to start to think about, can we start to do this convergence between um, big data analytics and, and machine learning and artificial intelligence with what we're doing on the modeling side? Uh, and they looked at the BP uh, velocity model benchmark, and, uh, and you can see that here on the left. Uh, and they basically, the way that, that they do this today is they manually pick and optimize around a velocity model. And, and you can kind of see the result with FWI here in the middle about what they're able to simulate, which is quite a bit better than they've ever been able to do before. Uh, and then what we've been able to do, and this is a little video here, uh, with machine learning is iterate on choosing the best velocity model that they could find uh, over time, and we can get over time through these iterations to a much better answer. And so this is, I think, just a great example and just a sneak peek at what I think is possible in the future as we start to integrate the capabilities of deep learning and artificial intelligence with our traditional world of modeling and simulation. And there's some other great examples of people really starting to push out today already and starting to think about how do we use this technology in new and unique ways. Uh, our partners from ExxonMobil ran a, you know, 700,000 processor plus res sim job uh, on the Blue Water system at NCSA. Really an amazing result, thousands of times better uh, than they've been able to do before uh, on that model. So a really exciting, I think, example of using these technologies. Uh, at KAUST, I know David talked uh, earlier, I'm sure he talked about uh, what they've done with Saudi Aramco in doing a trillion cell reservoir model uh, on their full machine at KAUST, almost a petabyte of data uh, that they used on this model. These are like amazing numbers overall that people are doing today on these systems. Uh, which is super exciting. And, and PGS, as we just mentioned, uh, 200 gigabyte data set per shot uh, on, uh, on their machine with a 600 terabyte data set. So really, really interesting, I think, of companies today that are really starting to think about taking advantage of these new technologies and what they can provide. And I will tell you that as I've shown, the world is shifting over the next few years, and I think more and more of us across the industry will have to start thinking about how do we use this technology different over time. So I'll stop there. Uh, I really appreciate, again, uh, being able to come out here. Uh, and I do think that while what it took us to get here is probably a little bit different than what we're going to do over the next few years, I do think that there is a pathway to get there. 
and, uh, and one that as an industry, I feel really confident that we'll be able to solve together. So thank you very much. Thank you. Let's take one question, and then John can start setting up for the panel. So one quick, quick question for, for, for Pete. Or do you just want to get to the panel to, to interrogate him even more? I have a few more questions for Peter on the panel, so yeah. there you go. <laughs> OK, so we'll, we'll, we'll let's thank him again, and then I'll let the John have the.